What's up, babies? Um, welcome back to my page. And I know it's been quite a while. I'm so, I'm just gonna just get right to it. I'm so nervous. I'm so scared to be sharing my story with you guys. I'm so scared to be honest about every single thing that's ever happened to me. I'm terrified and it's way too long to give it in one part. So this is gonna be three different chapters, 20 minutes long a piece. Hope that works for you. Trigger warning. I'm talking about abuse. I'm talking about foster care. I'm talking about my eating disorder in here. I'm talking about losing my parents. A lot of deep emotional crap. And I'm sorry in advance. I don't know why I'm apologizing. There's no reason to apologize. I just want to let you guys know what's going on. So I'm starting this project called The Seven Wonders. And I'm using it to raise awareness for a foundation I want to start called The Age Up Project for kids who have aged out of foster care. I aged out of the system and no one told me what to do, so I'll explain that more later during this. I love you guys so much. Thank you for watching in advance. I love you, I love you, I love you. Bye. Did you hear my burp on the mic? What if I lost this forever? Oh, there's gonna be sand in there forever. You know, some people just say like, if you don't do something with your trauma, then that's all that it was. It was just trauma. Foster care was freaking traumatizing and aging out of the foster care system was even more traumatizing. Sand in my eyes. I was on a roll. Anyway, um, I want to start a foundation for kids who have aged out of the system. It's extremely important to me and I don't know what that's gonna take or what that's gonna need. And I know that sounds incredibly ambitious for someone who's currently 23 years old, but I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna figure out what it is people need. I'm gonna interview people who have been in the system. I'm gonna interview people who currently work with kids in the system, people who have aged out, people who have ended up in jail because of the system. Just every little aspect of what it could be because I think it would be really arrogant just to think I know from my own personal experience what it is that kids are gonna need now, you know? It's a different world. It's a different generation y'all are growing up and out into. And I just, I want it to be safer. I want there to be, I, don't, I want there to be someone you can talk to. There was no one for me to talk to. This trip, we're road tripping from San Diego back to my property in Austin. We're currently beelining it to Phoenix, Arizona, to Tempe, I believe, um, to meet with a dear friend of mine who, when I posted about wanting to start this, she messaged me and let me know, hey, I actually grew up in the foster care system. I have a story to tell. Not only that, but she currently works with kids in the system and their parents, and I've never heard of anybody doing that. And we'll definitely get to more of that later they'll explain it way better than I ever can but I've never I've never heard of anybody working with parents that have lost their kids to get them back usually it's just like you know what you lose them you messed up like that's it and so I'm really stoked about that I'm really excited for where that's going to take us hello how do I open it <laughs> I thought that you locked me in there <laughs> good stretch that's how you should wake up in the morning. I stepped in my mid-morning pee. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but true. Oh, the sunlight feels nice. Big morning part. Oh, hi, welcome to the vlog. I've never told my story. I don't know how to tell my story, you know? Like, it feels so like weird. Like, where do you start? Like, I was born March 25th, 1999 in the Methodist Hospital in Houston. It's like, that's not where it started. You know, I don't have memories then. My earliest memory is actually like my saddest memory, like ever. Like I remember my sixth birthday, my mom took me to Six Flags, not Six Flags, SeaWorld, which, boo SeaWorld, yes, let's cancel them, I agree. But my mom took me to SeaWorld and we stayed in one of the hotels, like, or motels outside of there. We didn't have money like that. But it was our first trip with our stepdad after they got married. And I don't even remember meeting him much before they got married. It was almost kind of like she just showed up with him one day and was like, I married this guy. And we went to SeaWorld for my birthday. We saw the little whale show. I remember we splashed by the water. This is when I started my snow globe collection. I don't currently still have this snow globe collection. But I started collecting snow globes and my mom would give me one every year on my birthday. But she woke me up on my birthday with a cupcake without fail every year. She would wake me up early as fuck, one cupcake, one candle, and just her singing me happy birthday. I remember how amazing that was and we left that same day. And on the drive home, she got a call from her doctors and she pulled over on the side of the road and was just sobbing and like talking with my stepdad outside. And I could hear them just debating like whether or not they were gonna tell us something. And she pulled us all out of the car and told us she was diagnosed with cancer. And I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I was six. <laughs> like I was like, okay, mom's sick. Like I okay. Like I had no idea what that was gonna 
have in store for me or what that was going to mean, what that was going to look like for the rest of my life. I didn't know that it was going to have such a crazy effect on everything that I would ever become. I, she always made everything feel normal. Like I tell people that I was in foster care and I talk about my childhood of being abused by my stepfather because he became insanely abusive after that point. But before I tell any of that, my view of my childhood is so incredibly skewed because of how amazing my mom was. So fit to be a mother, despite everything that she was going through, she made everything special, everything incredible. I remember my seventh birthday, I was at the Basil's Gymnastics Gym and I had cakes, like tiny, I hated cake, but I loved cupcakes. And she got a bunch of cupcakes and they made my face and it had pigtails and it was wearing the same outfit that I was wearing. And like, it was just a me as cupcakes. And every year she would one up herself. I would do basils for the first few years. And she like, when I got to middle school, she like knew how important it was, like that like other kids liked you or something. I don't really know. <laughs> she rented out the entire iMac, the entire movie theater for just me and my friends. And like everybody wanted invitations to my birthday parties because my mom made gift bags and she like paid for absolutely fucking everything. Like it was just insane. Like she went above and beyond because she knew she wouldn't be there for long. You know, like money didn't matter to her, nothing ever mattered to her. She just threw all her freaking all into everything, no matter how sick she was, no matter how tired she was. She was just always there, you know? She always got me. She never judged me for anything. I don't remember ever fighting with her, like, at all. Whoa. It's crazy, I never thought about that. I don't think we ever fought. I like thinking about her. You know, like from that point, I remember my mom got diagnosed and she started spending a lot of time in the hospital. Like a lot of time in the hospital. My stepdad, I just remember like him being really mean all of the time. Like it didn't matter what we did. We woke up early as fuck and if we made a single sound in the house, pushed out the door, doors locked until sundown every single day. And it'd be like, okay, well, I thought that's just what happened to everybody. Like I thought this is how like parents were, you know, I was like, everybody gets locked outside, which was kind of similar in my neighborhood, but I came from like a not so great neighborhood. My mom made great dinners because she didn't know about any of the stuff that was going on. And we didn't tell her because we thought it was normal. It was just like full of, it's so weird because it has like that childlike wonder around it of like, you didn't know anything was really that bad at first. So it didn't seem like that big of a deal until it was like years of getting locked outside and not eating enough and like, that still affects me to this day. I speed eat all of my food. Like I eat like it's gonna be taken away from me because it was. That, when that slowly turned into physical abuse, the more time my mom spent in the hospital, people were like, oh, like he hit you, like he beat you with a belt. No, like it was bad. Like <laughs> it was like kitchen appliance bad. And I don't know if you can relate out there to kitchen appliance abuse or just household appliance abuse, then like you were, you were really abused. And like, don't let anyone ever take that away from you. Like he beat me with a vacuum cleaner cord. He <laughs> beat me with the vacuum, like pick it up and throw it on me. Like take, rip the microwave out of the wall and threw it at my head. I ended up in the hospital for that. And there were so many instances where I ended up in school with bruises and just had to say that my siblings and I were fighting or that I fell off my bike. But you can only say that so many times before people pick up on it. And when CPS first got involved, it was just lie, 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 deny, deny, because our stepdad was like, yo, if you, if you tell anybody, I'll kill your mom. And like, she was the most valuable thing in the world to us. It was like, no way, no way am I doing that. I can't even tell my mom about it. They could tell we were scared shitless. They're trained, they know what's going on, but they couldn't do anything because we wouldn't admit it. And then my mom had a really intense surgery and didn't wake up for a while and we caved, we absolutely caved. Our grandparents picked us up and we told them absolutely everything. We were like, he's been hitting us for years. He's been abusing us. He's been beating us. Like we get locked outside every day. We don't eat enough. Like we told them everything. And my, since my grandfather was a police officer, they called CPS. They came to the house and we told them everything because our grandparents made it really clear to us mom was never waking up. Like <laughs> they were like, she's, she's gone. And so started grieving her at the age of nine, just being like, okay, mom's never coming back. CPS got involved. We started living with our grandparents. And then one day my mom came home, like four or five months later, she came to my grandparents' house while they were gone. And I remember her opening the door and I was sitting at the kitchen table and I just, my face dropped and I was so confused because to my knowledge, she'd been dead for like four months. 
She came and found me. I told her everything that happened. I sobbed, I cried, she held me, and I did not see my grandparents again until my mom's funeral. I didn't see them for years, and I never really forgave them for what they did. Like, I thought my mom died, and I know they did it because they wanted the best for us. They just wanted us to stop hurting. I know it was from a good place, but they gave us hurt all of their own, but that's a story for another time. Let's walk and talk. Sarah tucked her pants so high. <laughs> If it was gonna rain, I would not do this, but... All right, it's rain. I see you changing. You still got spikes in there. Whoa. I feel like I don't need to get in the water to cross it. I feel like I can... I can scramble this shit out. All right, let's do it. The water's for sure like 30 minus 30 degrees. Yeah, negative, negative degrees. I bet you a snake lives in that hole. Ooh. Apparently there's more waterfall though, the further you go. So is this is enough for us visually and aesthetically, or do we need more? <laughs> Like, those are like bathtub bubbles. <sighs> this is actually probably harder than we think it is. That might be the wave. I was like, those are really slippy. Mama didn't raise a bitch. No, no. Oh my God. Those are bubbles. I thought it was salt. Okay. Mama didn't raise a bitch. Sacrifice my shoes. Bye, kid. I love him so much. Oh. Hello there. <laughs> well, waterfall. We did it. We scrambled. We got stung by the cacti. For minutes there, I was like, it doesn't exist, but we could hear it like from the beginning, so. And then we were almost not, we were, we were at the one, that we were at like two seconds ago, and then boom, we climbed up here to this. And it's much better than that first one. <laughs> kind of looks like it's peeing. You want a cold blend? <laughs> We're seeing a tiny fire. Let's bring it back to the trauma. <laughs> and at this point, she knew about my stepdad and all the things that were going on, because we had to tell her. Um, but she was still just really, really sick. So she brought him back into our lives. However, CPS was, even though we had a meeting with them and told them we lied about everything, we were like, our grandparents made us lie, they told us our mom died, like, we take it back. They were like really suspicious because of all our previous history. So this is when my stepdad got a little more creative with abuse and it turned from less physical to more psychological. If I walked in front of the TV while he was drinking a beer and watching a show, it would result in 500 sentences. And it was always some arbitrary amount. It never made sense. There was no rhyme or reason. There was no pattern to it, which really made us even more messed up. And it was the same every time with just a little bit of variation, but it would be, I am so, 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 so sorry that I am such a fuck up. I do not deserve to be here. I'm sorry that you have to deal with me and if I ever mess up again, you can hang me off the roof by my ankles and drop me on my head. And there would just be these little variants or like he'd add like a so. And my siblings and I would spend all of our free time writing these sentences because there was no way to do them all. There was no way to catch up. On top of that, we had all our school. We had all our homework. So while I'm at school, I, instead of like going to recess like everybody else or like going to PE, I would, I would skip it and I would sit and I would write those sentences at school. And he could always tell if we were like catching up, you know, like I'd get home and if I had 300 sentences and I was 250 in, he would correct me and be like, I didn't say that. And I'd be like, what do you mean you didn't say that? He's like, I didn't say I'm so, 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 so sorry. I said, I'm so, so, so sorry. Redo it. You couldn't just cross it out or erase it. You'd have to rewrite every single one. It got to a point where he would leave the house and my siblings and I would sprint to the study and try to like print them onto like 
<laughs> ruled paper. Like we tried so hard to like take our sheets of notebook paper, put it in the printer and get it to print it out. And then they were like, well, how are we gonna do the numbers? And we were just trying to cheat and like find all these ways to do things, but it just wasn't working. Like there was no way to get around it. And it was just that torment for months and years. Like he never let up and he never gave us a break. There's no part of me that can comprehend what would make you hit a child. There's no part of me that can make me comprehend what would make you psychologically torment children. Like, I don't know what was wrong with him. I really, I'll never be able to put it together. I'll never be able to, I haven't seen him since my mom died. Not, not a single conversation, nothing. Just, he wanted nothing to do with us and we wanted nothing to do with him. I can't even imagine if after she passed that we got stuck with him and his family. It was interesting though, cause like we'd spend holidays with his family out in Livingston and they also beat the shit out of us and they also made us write sentences and it just made me realize that that's so hard to admit but like it now it was his fault but it wasn't also his fault like it was generational trauma passed down and passed down like his parents beat the shit out of him and their parents beat the shit out of them and, and I just such a damn shame dude like I just can't even believe that was like a part of my life. And my mom tried to make it as like bearable as possible. And there's so much that like good that I remember her doing. And it's so hard for people. It's typically dads abusing, abusing their kids, right? And then moms knowing, but like not being able to separate themselves. But I don't blame her. She couldn't have done it on her own. She didn't have a support system. Like I know what that's like now in my life and knowing that like even if someone was hurting me, I'd like to think that I'd walk away. But she was dying. And she didn't have anybody else. She didn't think anybody else loved her. So I don't blame her. It was shitty, but I don't blame her. Let's wait until he passes people before I drop some trauma bombs. <laughs> when I was 12, my mom actually went into remission. She was the longest person at the time to live with leiomyosarcoma, which was a smooth muscle cancer, super rare. Um, and every, like, every six months, they'd tell her she had six months to live. And she just kept living. Anyways, it was crazy. So we were like six years into it. She finally goes to remission. They're like, you're cancer free. You don't have anything anymore. She did, had this like weird freak surgeon from Australia came down, did this crazy procedure, and she was all good to go. So she kicked my stepdad out the house. She booked us a cruise for spring break. She like, just was scheduling all these trips all over the place. We were going to Disney, we were going on cruises, we were gonna do everything. And within a month, the cancer came back and it was everywhere. And she tried to move up those dates. She tried to move up the cruise, like make it her last everything. You know, our stepdad was finally out of our lives. We finally just had our mom and we were like ready for a future that just involved her. And it just accelerated so quickly. She ended up in hospice and home care for a while. And this is when I met my foster family. Um, it was my sister's small group leader at church, whose <sighs> name I won't mention because I don't want to start things. <laughs> but um, they came and picked us up one day and were like, hey, your mom's actually going to switch from in-home hospice care to at an actual hospice facility. And I was super opposed to it, of course. Obviously, I wanted to be with my mom. I remember my mom came out of hospice just for my very last birthday on March 25th. She passed away on 420 and I had the best birthday with her. And then it was kind of like she was just gone from there. She was constantly in a hospital bed. She wasn't able to talk, but they said that she could hear us, which I don't know if that was bullshit or if that was real, but we went along with it. I wanted to believe that she could hear me. so I go to hospice every single day after school and lay next to her and just tell her absolutely everything that she could ever possibly know about me just to make sure she knew it all. And then one day my foster parents came and picked us up from school. Early they pulled me, my brother and my sister out and they were like, hey, we're just gonna go visit your mom. And I was like, why? <laughs> we were gonna go see her in like four hours. So I didn't understand why they were pulling us out and I should have been able to put two and two together, but I didn't. They asked if we wanted to stop for food. And this haunted me for years afterwards. I regretted so much swinging through that McDonald's. 
because it was my call. I was like, yeah, let's get food because nobody told us the seriousness of it. And like, if I had known she was dying right then, <laughs> I wouldn't have stopped. I would have gone. I would have done everything in my power just to be there. She passed away like 15 minutes before we pulled in the door. And I remember they sat us down in like the little hospice family waiting room area. They were just staring at us and I was like, why can't I go stay with mom? You said I could spend the night tonight. Like I brought a bag, I was ready. I was like, can I still stay the night tonight? And I know everybody was in shock. Nobody knew how to handle it. But I remember Lisa telling me, yes, you can stay the night. And they just stared at us. I was like, what? And you could just feel it, you know? Like the energy in the room was off and everything felt wrong. And I don't even remember who said it first, who said our mom passed away. But I remember my sister froze and my brother and I both started screaming and crying. And I sprinted down the doors of that hospice like facility and she was at the very end of the hallway. It felt like a stupid scene in the movie that I wish I never lived. And I busted in the door and I saw her there and I, I wish so badly I'd never seen her like that because it haunts my dreams and my nightmares. And it's been over a decade now since she died. And I can still feel how cold she was. I think she's just everywhere. Like I think she's just a part of the energy. She's a part of the wind. She's a part of the sunlight. Like there's some moments when it's so undeniable, you know? I'll, I'll just be sitting somewhere and I'll feel a breeze and it's like I can just like feel her over my shoulders. So I know she's everywhere. Like there's no doubt in my mind that she is a part of everything and she sees everything. I think about that a lot when I wonder, I'm like, did, did she ever know if I was gay? <laughs> did she ever know that I struggled with addiction? Would she be mad at me? Would she be proud of me for getting sober? Like, does she know? Like, God, I wish she could have met Theo more than anything. Like, so many of my friends, I see her in them. I have a friend, Rachel, who, like, embodies my mother. It's so funny. It's so crazy. Like, she's so much of her. Yeah. I don't know. I think she's everywhere. Yeah. I think she's cool, and I think she's on this hike. She kind of just glowed, dude. And not just because she was, like, super pale, but, like, she just glowed like she was never not smiling. She was never not kind to people. She was if some if one person was frowning, she'd make them all smile. And like she couldn't just like give kindness to one person. She had to give it to everybody. She couldn't pick and choose. You know, everybody needed it. Everybody needed that love. Everybody deserved to smile. Everybody deserved all the light and love this world has to offer, you know? And she taught me that. And that's so cool because I try my best to be that and embody that and like feel that in everything that I do. But nobody did it like my mom. Nobody did it like my mom. Cute little plump, strawberry blonde lady. I, my favorite was when she was bald. I love my bald mom. Just a little egg. And I can just remember her with her little party hat on on her birthday. I wanted to always make everything as special for her as she made it for me, but that, impossible. <laughs> Impossible, dude. Nobody could make you feel as good about yourself as my mom did. Like, she made everyone feel like they were the only person in the world when she was talking to them. Dude, I love the fuck out of her, and I miss her so much. I miss her so much. And confronting the reality that, like, I'm almost at a point in my life where she's been gone longer than I knew her. But I still remember what her laugh sounds like. I don't really remember what her voice sounds like. I wish social media was a thing back then in the way it was now. Because I don't have like videos or pictures really. Not of myself, not of her. That's why I thought that like I wasn't real for a really long time. I dissociated for a very long time after my mom died because there was no proof of anything. God, that sucks, dude. That's so crazy. How we have advanced. She wouldn't have cared about me, like, saving the world or saving other people. She would have just wanted it to be, like, my siblings. Like, 
she left me a scrapbook whenever, before she passed away, she made each of my siblings and I a scrapbook. And the predominant theme in all of that was just stay close with your siblings, take care of your siblings, like love your siblings, make sure they know that they deserve to be here. And they're the reason really why I want to take care of other people. It's like I see them and their trauma and my trauma and so many other kids and so many other people. And I don't want anyone to have to hit rock bottom like we did. And she wouldn't have wanted that either. Mom's name is Sarah. My name is Sayla. It was supposed to be Sarah. <laughs> there is an L in the middle because of a typo. <laughs> No, because my dad spelled it wrong. <laughs> yeah. All the corrects to salad, but aside from that, it's, it's pretty stellar. I don't think I'd pass as a Sarah. Ah! Okay, thanks so much for watching that first episode. Tune in next week, and you guys will see episode two where I talk about a whole lot more. Let's dive into the trauma, baby. I love you guys so much. I'll see you next week.